Okay, so we are we are still going through the book of Acts, and we are learning from the early church how to be the church. This is absolutely important that we we take a close look at the book of Acts because of the way the church started. We never want to miss important details. We never want to miss uh, important uh, things that God has put in his word for us to see, for us to grasp, for us to emulate. And it's absolutely necessary for us to, to take time out and, and, and look at these things. Because if we're not doing what the early church did, then what are we doing? If we're not modeling ourselves after the very first church, then who are we modeling ourselves after? And so the, the template is given to us. The, the, the template has been handed to us. And so we want to make sure that we're grasping the, 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 the important facts that the Bible gives us as we become a thriving, growing church who desires to reach its community, who desires to reach its city, who desires to reach the world. Um, so let's uh, let's go ahead and, and, and dive right in. Let's see here. Bear with me a sec. All right. So you guys should be able to see my, my screen. And uh, we're looking at today, Acts chapter number four. Now it's it's gonna be it's gonna be good because the cool thing about Acts number four is Acts number four is a continuation of everything that we have been seeing take place after the events of the cross, after the events of the, the, the crucifixion, the resurrection, after the events um, in Acts chapter 1, where they're praying and they're seeking God for the promise that Jesus told them to wait for, and that was the promise of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter number two, where the Holy Ghost fills the upper room, and initially 120 people, over 120 people are filled. They spill out into the streets. People accuse them of being drunk. Peter preaches an amazing message about Jesus and where he fits in biblical prophecy and how the prophets of the Old Testament spoke of Jesus being the Messiah, being the Christ, and how the Jewish people of that day did not recognize him, not fully understanding the, the, the depthness of the scriptures and the prophecies and how they killed him, they crucified him. And so based on what they heard in that sermon, they made it a point to, to, um, to ask what they ought to do. And so they asked the question, what do we do in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38? Peter said, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so they did that. Over 3,000 people got saved. Over 3,000 believers these are believers. They, they heard the preaching, they believed it, and they obeyed it. And so um, they were baptized. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. We see at the end of chapter two where um, the, 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 the church comes together, they sell everything they have, they come together in unity, they're meeting um, in homes, they're having prayer, they're having the Lord's Supper, they're eating regular meals together. They're just a beautiful spirit of unity in Acts chapter two. And then we, and, and all of this is taking place in AD 29, AD 30, somewhere around there. And so continuing into Acts chapter number three, we read about um, how uh, Peter and John were going to the temple to pray. And they would go to the temple and they would pray. And, uh, and what would happen was, um, 
they would, you know, this would be their typical custom. But this particular time, um, this particular time, there was a lame man there, a man who couldn't walk. And he had been lame for his, his whole life, his entire life since birth. And he would be brought there and uh, he would be brought there to beg for money. And so people would give him money right outside the temple there, right outside the church. Except this time when Peter and John showed up, God used them to heal this man. When this man became healed, what ended up happening was um, he began to praise God. He began to run and dance and, and, and display himself publicly that uh, he had received his healing. And so people began to notice. And the interesting thing is, just like in the book of Acts, Peter stood up and preached. And it's, it's very, very interesting because when Peter preached he, in Acts chapter number three, he preached the exact same message he preached in Acts chapter number two. The same events took place. There was a supernatural occurrence in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit was poured out. In Acts 3, a lame man was healed. People are curious. Peter says that what you see is of God. And he goes on to preach Jesus. And so while he is preaching to them, people are becoming interested. While he is preaching to the crowds of of Jewish people that are at the temple worshiping. People are curious because they knew this man. This act, this lame man was actually quite famous because for, for his whole life, people would, well, you know, most of his life, he would bring him to the temple to beg for alms. Everybody knew the guy. And so, uh, and so Peter saw the opportunity he preached to them Jesus. He quoted scripture. He reminded them that this Jesus of, of the prophets that or for the, the Jesus that the prophet spoke about, the Messiah, was Jesus come in the flesh and you crucified him. But the interesting thing is, like in the book of Acts, people were curious, but something different takes place. And we're gonna we're gonna take a look at that. Something different takes place rather than in book of Acts where everybody, you know, comes and they all get saved. Listen to what takes place. We're going to read Acts chapter four. We're going to start at verse one and four, and we're just going to go through the chapter. But I want you to listen to this. It says. It says, while Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus, there is a resurrection of the dead. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, they put them in jail until morning. So while they were preaching, before anyone could say, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter, Peter gives them the message before this could even happen. It says that the religious leaders interrupted them and threw them in jail. But here's the interesting thing about the word of God. When the word of God is preached, when preachers, when people aren't ashamed to boldly speak up about their God, it's, it goes on to say that no matter what happens to the preacher, there's still fruit that will remain. And so verse four tells us, but many of the people who heard their message believed it. And so the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000. So we see now that the number of believers has now grown to about 5,000. Um, I'm not sure if this is 5,000 people that believed in this instance, or if this is 2,000 plus the 3,000 from Acts chapter 2. But the fact remains, there is an increase. And so I'm inclined to believe that uh, this is, you know, an additional 5,000. Um, but y'all can fact check me on that when you do your own study. But the point is, Peter had a different challenge this time, because now the religious leaders were concerned that the Jesus that they were preaching, that Peter and John were preaching, was going to create issues with the people. So 
What they did not want is they did not want anything coming between their influence, talking about the religious leaders. They didn't want anyone or anything coming in between the people and their influence. And here you have Peter and John at the temple preaching Jesus Christ. Let's continue. In, Acts, or, or in verse number five, it says, the next day, the council of all the rulers and the elders and the teachers of religious law, they met in Jerusalem. Ananias, the high priest, was there, along with Sophias, John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. They brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? So here's what we see. And I want us to, I, I, I found this little bit of, of detail very interesting. It said that Ananias, the high priest was there along with Siaphas or Siaphas, however you pronounce his name, John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. So we know that Siaphas or Siaphas or Caiaphas, whatever his name was, he was, his, he was the son-in-law of Ananias. Not sure who John Alexander are, but it then goes on to say that there were other relatives of the high priest that made up this Sanhedrin council, that made up this, this, this group of religious leaders who pretty much orchestrated the, the, the religious uh, goings-on of the Jewish people of that day. I want you to look at the person to you and say nepotism. You see, it's interesting because we see a family of religious leaders trying their best to hold on to power. And they're concerned about a bunch of people who literally just got saved a couple of days ago. They're concerned about them. They're concerned about these people who are now preaching with boldness and with courage and with passion, and they're concerned about how that's going to affect their hustle. This family of religious leaders is absolutely concerned that this new group of people is, gonna, is going to shake things up and draw the attention of everyone else away from them. And so this, this same spirit can even be active in churches today, where we see Churches that have, you know, everyone in leadership has the same last name. We see everyone in, in that holds a position is related. Uh, Son-in-laws and daughter-in-laws and brothers and cousins and grandpas. And this is very, very common. And it, it is usually somewhat troublesome and problematic when people come among them and they begin to they begin to preach the same, the, 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 the message that we all stand for, but then people are drawn. And so uh, this, this, this that, we, that we're seeing in the book of Acts is still prevalent today. And so um, I found that little bit of fact interesting that the, the nepotism that existed among the religious leaders was challenged and it was confronted by the boldness of the apostles. But verse number seven, I want you to check this out because this here sets up the rest of the chapter. So they arrest them, they throw them in jail overnight and they bring them out the next morning and they says here that they brought the two disciples and demanded by what power or in whose name have you done this? So clearly, they understand the idea of authority and that anyone who speaks with a certain of, um, boldness has to speak under the authority or in, a, in the authority of someone higher than them. And so they wanted to know whose name, because they understood that if something is to be done on this level, this, this type of healing, this type of supernatural power, there had to be a name. You must catch this detail. There had to be a name by which 
this man was healed, by which there had to be a name um, by which this authority was, was, was pronounced or given. And, um, and so they ask him, how, how did you do this? Whose name did you do it? Um, and so here's a, just a rhetorical question. What would you say if you were Peter and John? If someone of importance, let's say, um, let's say the mayor of, of Houston, Texas, or let's say the president of the United States, they called you in front of their entire committee, of their entire city council, or the entire Senate, or the entire House of Representatives, the Congress, and they asked you, what are you out there preaching? What is it that is actually going on in your church? What would you say if you were Peter and John? Because I promise you, there are a lot of preachers today who have platforms. They have the ear of, of world leaders. They have the ears of, of, of famous you know, entertainers, athletes, actors, and actresses, what have you. They have access to people in power. And, I, and, and these religious leaders clam up. They're afraid to declare the name of Jesus Christ. Sure, they might say God, or they may speak to a higher power or, any, or something to that effect, but rarely do we see people stand up and proclaim the name of Jesus Christ as God and as the authority by which we act and by which we move. Um, so I find this very interesting that they asked this question. So let's take a look and see what the apostles had to say. Very interesting details here. It says, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Very important that you note that. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He received it in Acts chapter number two. He said to them, rulers and elders of our people, of our people. He's speaking in camaraderie. He's letting them know that, hey, we're all the same. He says, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man that you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. He made it very plain. There is no ambiguity. There is no general generality in his speaking. He made it very plain, very plain. He says, do you want to know? <laughs> do you want to know how he was healed? Well, let me state this very clearly to you, people of Israel. He specifically made a mention because everyone in the temple were Jews. They were all Israelites. And so he said it was by the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to seal off the sermon, to seal off the testimony in verse number 12. And if you have a Bible, I think you ought to highlight this because this is an important scripture. This is one of the foundational scriptures of the early church. In verse number 12, he says, there is salvation in no one else. No one else. He, he's calling out all other gods with little g. He says there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. There is no other name. I don't, I don't, I'm sorry. I hate to break it to you, but there isn't a name, there isn't a title, there isn't anything that we can call on that we can be saved. It's through the name of Jesus. This is why we baptize in the name of Jesus. And we're gonna read more about this later. But remember, Peter made this very plain in Acts chapter number two, when he said, repent 
and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. So we, we, we see the emphasis, again, being placed on the name. That's why we specifically pray in the name of Jesus. We pray for God to heal and for God to deliver and for God to bless in the name of Jesus. We pray or we baptize in the name of Jesus. Whatever you do in word or in deed, it says in Colossians, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. So this was a very, very powerful setup to what the early church was about to experience. They were arrested and put in jail for simply doing something good in the name of Jesus. They healed a man and got arrested for that. I want you all to understand something very, very important. They were arrested and put in jail for simply allowing God to use them in the supernatural or in the miraculous. They were thrown in jail because a man was healed. It's If this is what the early church went through, just expect there to be pushback when we begin to see miracles in our churches. Expect there to be pushback. Expect there to be actual confrontation from people outside of our church when these things begin to happen and when these things begin to go public. Expect that. So I want us to quickly read down through Acts 13 and 22 just to get a bit of a, a bit of context. Okay, it says the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scripture. They didn't have any special training, but yet they were filled with the Holy Ghost. This is very important. Me and uh, me and Everett, we got together um, this uh, yesterday and we talked for a little bit. Just, just talking about ministry, just talking about the church and what God's doing. And um, him and I both agree, you know, that it's it's unfortunate that oftentimes our pastors put more emphasis on their education than they do their understanding of scripture. And here we see that God is not impressed with your doctorate degree. God is not impressed with where you stand on an educational scale, but more importantly, do you have boldness? Are you filled with the Holy Ghost? Because if you are, and if you do, then God will give you the understanding. Doesn't take a, a, a big brain. And so let's let's keep reading. It says uh, they were they had no special training in the scriptures. It says, and they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. So there's another key point. Can people look at you and tell that you've been with Jesus? See, when we come into the church, when we when we when we um when we're born again, there should be something about us that people ought to recognize. There should be something in us. There should be something on the outside of us that shows people that we had been with Jesus. Let's keep reading. It says, but they could not, or they could see the man who had been healed standing right, um, right there among them. There was nothing the council could say. It says so, it says, but since they could see the man who had been healed standing right, um, right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred amongst themselves. So here you had this miracle standing in front of them. They couldn't argue that. So they had them released. What shall we, what should we do with these men? They asked each other. We can't deny that they have performed a miraculous sign and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. <laughs> I like that. Before social media. It says, but to keep them from spreading their propaganda, propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in the name, in Jesus's name again. So they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Now, they're, they're, they're flexing their power. 
But I want you to understand what Holy Ghost, with Holy Ghost filled, bold, boldness driven apostles say in this situation. It says, but Peter and John replied, verse number 19, in the New Living Translation. It says, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? Wow, that is boldness. It, verse number 20, we cannot stop telling about everything that we have seen and heard. It says the council then threatened them further, but they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God. Everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. Wow. This, folks, is something that we need to understand as the early church, that we stand for Jesus under opposition from any source. It doesn't matter if it's the president of the United States or if it's your coworker. We ought to stand for Jesus and we ought to not be ashamed to share this message. Why? Because people are waiting to hear it. There, are, there could be thousands of people waiting to hear your message, waiting to hear your testimony of how God has changed your life and how God can change theirs as well. So we can't allow ourselves to be afraid or timid. Let's continue reading. We're going to skip all the way down to Acts 29. It says, um, and now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. So this is what happened. They let them out of jail. They went back and they started sharing what had happened to all of the believers. And all of the believers got excited. And so they began to just just testify and talk about what God had done and how they had suffered persecution, but they had to be let go. And so then they began to have a prayer meeting. They began to pray and they began to talk to God. And this is their prayer. It says, and now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. All of the believers heard about the boldness of Peter and John, and so they prayed for boldness. If it worked for my brother, Lord, I want it to work for me. Whatever he's doing, I want that same blessing on my life. And so they prayed for boldness. And it, in verse 30, it says, stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. If you're wondering how you can pray through this fast, because church, we've been on a three-day fast just for our church and for all members of the church to grow and to come up to the next level. This is next level prayer. They're not, uh, they're praying, they're saying, Lord, give us boldness in preaching your word. They're saying, uh, stretch out your hand with healing power. They're praying for miraculous signs and wonders to be done in Jesus' name. Pray these prayers, church. Pray these prayers, believing that God is able to use you to accomplish his will on the earth, to accomplish his will in the city, in your community. Pray these prayers. Pray for boldness. Pray for healings to take place. Pray for the miraculous. And then verse number 31, listen to this. It says, after this prayer, after this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. So pray that God fills you with the Holy Spirit so that you have the boldness because the boldness is not going to come through you. It's going to come through the Holy Spirit moving through you. And so you won't be able to accomplish this on your own. 
But when God fills you with the Holy Spirit, you're going to you're going to preach this thing. You're going to testify about what God has done for you and you won't care who criticizes you. You won't care who talks about you, but you'll be so full of boldness that you'll just speak it anyway. So, I really like though. I really like what happened in Acts 29 or in, in 4 and 29 where it says they asked God. They said Give us great boldness. And then after the Holy Spirit filled them up, it says, and then they preached with boldness. <laughs> so they prayed for it. God gave them the Holy Ghost. And then they preached what they asked for. They preached, they prayed for boldness. God filled them with his spirit. And then they preached with boldness. This is not rocket science. This is not that deep, folks. If you want to be used of God, you pray for that thing. And then when God fills you with his spirit, you will be able to accomplish that thing. Do not think that you can do anything for God without the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say that again for the people in the back. Don't think that you can do anything for God as far as the supernatural goes, as far as stretching out your hand with healing power, as far as uh, many miraculous signs and wonders being done through you. Don't think you can do that without the Holy Spirit. We already, we go back to, to our first Bible study in the book of Acts. This church was, this church began on resurrection power. And Jesus told them that they would be witnesses once they received this power. It, it, it started with power, it continued with power, and it's going to take us to be able to be filled with God's spirit so that we can operate in power. If you do not have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, this don't apply to you yet. You prayed and asked God to fill you. All right, let's keep, let's continue. We're going to wrap this thing up. And so, and in, in, uh, we're going to take a look at Acts chapter number 32, and we're going to read down to verse 37. And again, we're going to wrap this thing up. So it says, um, all the believers united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. Uh, there, there were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Here's an example. It says, for instance, there was Joseph, one of the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Uh, he was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field that he owned, so he owned some land, and he brought, brought the money to the apostles. So we're going to take a look at, at, at some of the quick takeaways from this. This is exactly what took place in the book of Acts chapter 2. This is exactly what happens when people are filled with the Holy Spirit. Unity and charity take place. In the book of Acts, we read how they all came together, they worshiped, they fellowshiped, they ate food, and they sold everything they had, and they combined it so that no one struggled. In our church, no one should struggle. Let's make that very plain. You see, this is why we give, and this is why we support the church, because if someone has a need, then just like we read here, the apostles can now draw from this, um, from the from the, the 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 bank, if you will, and help them out. So it's it's important for us to understand that if you're a believer, you're going to be so unified to the mission of God that you're going to give to help your brother and sister. You're going to give and you're going to support so that one day, if you have a need, you got a family, you got a group of family members that you can call on and say, hey, man, I'm struggling this week. I sure could use a hand. And then, like the Bible says, 
there will be uh, enough blessing available so that no one is needy among you, among them, among us. So this, this idea of unity is not just talking points. They're not just singing about it. They're not just, it's not just something that they say in sermons. They actually lived it. It says that they were united in heart and mind. This is what they lived every day. Nobody struggled among them. You know how the kids say now everybody's going to eat? That's the way they lived their lives. And if somebody got a little extra, they gave it to the apostles. And the apostles made sure that everybody was good. It says they testify and blessings follow. We're going to keep testifying about the goodness of the Lord, about what God has done. We're going to continue to testify among each other and, and to strangers. We're going to let people know because we want to see the blessings that follow that. And then again, it says they shared all of their resources. So I'm asking the question. We see the strength. We see the boldness. We see the unity among the early church. We see the charity, the generosity. Could it be that the church of 2023 isn't thriving the way it ought to because it's missing these basic um, um, attributes? Could it be that the early church set this up and we've ignored it? What we need to do is we need to make sure that we're gathering the key details throughout the book of Acts and then applying them to our church today so that we can see the same results that the early church seen. We're not going to see healings. We're not going to see miracles. We're not going to see thousands of people getting saved until we start lining up to what the early church did. And so I want us to, to just grasp this as you go throughout, throughout your week and as you read your Bibles and as you sit down with your families or, or maybe, um, you're, maybe you're, you're just meditating in your private time, I want you to remember how they prayed. They prayed to be able to move in boldness. They, they prayed for them to be able to work miracles. And they certainly adopted a spirit of unity. And so make that a part of your prayer. Make that a part of your, 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 your talk with God and asking God. And when God, and ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Ghost to come inside of you. You'll speak in another tongue, the Bible says, just like in Acts chapter two, and as we'll continue to read. And when that takes place, you're going to move different. You're going to walk different. You're going to talk different. You're going to think different. Why? Because the God of the universe is inside of you. And just like the apostles, you'll people will notice. People will notice. And interestingly enough, they didn't ask God to take trouble away, did they? They didn't pray for God to say, Lord, I pray that this is easy. I pray that churches, my life is goes good. I pray that I never get a flat tire. I pray I never get a headache. No. They prayed for strength to go through it. They didn't ask God to take trouble away. They asked God to give them strength to endure the trouble. If you just, if you're part of Remnant Park Church and you just completed the three-day fast, then you understand what trouble is. <laughs> you understand uh, what it means to depend on God for strength because this was not easy. And I'm going to continue. I'm not even going to stop. I've got momentum. So I'm going to keep going until I feel God releases me. But I just want you to understand that this beginning this fast, this was perfectly positioned with this Bible study. Because if God has kept you through this fast, God is going to continue to keep you if you just continue to ask for strength. And pray for unity. Pray for unity among your brothers and sisters at the church. Why? Because we went through this together. We went through this fast together and we're going to continue to be blessed together and we're going to continue to be to continue to suffer together. If 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 our brother or our sister is struggling, we're going to get rally behind them and we're going to support them and we're going to pray for them. Why? Because they're family. And then we'll continue to reach out to God in uh and represent the Lord in in boldness. So, uh we, we thank you guys for being a part today. I hope the Bible study has blessed you. I'm going to stop the recording, and those that are online, I'm going to give you a chance to respond. But uh, 
if if um, if you're following these lessons, go back, watch the early lessons that we put together. Um, you can find them on our YouTube channel at Remnant Park Church, or you can go to our website at www.remnantpark.com, where you can see a list of all of our um, sermons, all of the Bible studies, and the, the things that we've had. So we want to say God bless you, and we're going to have a chat.